Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're studying the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church for the fourth quarter of 2012. It's a series that discusses our fundamental beliefs, some of them, and it's a very provocative and challenging series. This is lesson number five in that series entitled Growing in Christ, and it's for study November 3, of 2012. We would like to ask you to get your Bible in hand, open it up, and let's pray together that we can understand this lesson. Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege we have that so much of Scripture, so much of your Word, your teachings are so readily available through the printed page, through electronic media of many different kinds. And now, Lord, we ask that you will guide that as we study these texts, these scriptures, these passages together, that we may gain from them the ideas which you had in mind for us as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. This lesson will focus on some of the many things Jesus accomplished by his death on the cross. Did Jesus have to die? Or maybe, as we prefer to say it, why did Jesus have to die? Was the death of Jesus on the cross primarily for the benefit of human beings? And how does that relate to the demonic forces in the universe? Do those who carefully study the crucifixion and its implications manage to benefit more than, from it than those who only study it casually? doesn't matter if we go to the effort to really try to understand what happened on that fateful weekend so long ago. Well, what are some of the aspects that separate Christianity from other religions? Desire of Ages, from Ellen White, page 35, paragraph 2, says, The principle that man can save himself by his own works lay at the foundation of every heathen religion. It had now, and this was talking about Jesus' day, become the principle of the Jewish religion. Satan had implanted this principle. Wherever it is held, men have no barrier against sin. Is that kind of the basis of many of our religions today, too, including evolution? Could be. Could be. I'll let you decide for yourself. Well, the Christian religion stands apart from every other religion for other reasons. Our God came down from heaven, lived a meritorious life, died a criminal's death, rose from the grave, returned to heaven, and promised to come back to take us to be with him for eternity. Nothing that we have done or can do or that for that matter ever could do would take the place of what God did. And we don't travel to some special place in the world to celebrate at the grave of our founder. Our founder, our Lord, our Savior is up there. He came back to life. According to the Bible, anyone who does not have Christ is a slave to sin. Take a look at that, John 8, 34. Jesus said to them, I am telling you the truth. Now, this is Jesus in his most extensive and most direct conversation with the religious leaders of his day, found here in John 8. Jesus says to these religious leaders, I am telling you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave of sin. I don't know how you could say it any clearer than that, right? And if you're a slave to sin, you're under a death sentence. Remember Romans 6.23. For sin pays its wage, death. But God's free gift is eternal life in union with Christ Jesus, our Lord. So what, what wage does sin pay? Death. death. So you're saying when you sin, you aren't controlling yourself. Sin is controlling you. Yes. Salvation, the Bible goes on to say, Acts 4.12, Salvation is to be found through Him alone. In all the world, there is no one else whom God has given who can save us. Thus, Christianity is a religion based on the fact that God has reached down to this planet 
to save us. There are many verses. Let me just mention a few. Isaiah 35, 10. Mark 10, 45. Galatians 4, 4 and 5. Titus 2, 14. Hebrews 9, 12. And 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19 that suggest that Christ has freed us from sin, grief, sorrow, death, and numerous other evils. I mean, there are many verses in the Bible that talk about the ways in which Christ has relieved us of many of these problems. The New Testament suggests that Christ's death is both sacrificial and substitutionary. Okay, now we're into more of those long terms. Now, Christ's death relieves us of all those sins. Does it relieve us of all those sins because Christ helps us not do those sins? Or does it relieve us from those sins because if you believe in Christ, you can still do those sins and he'll say, I forgive you. That I forgive you, yeah. So when you say that Christ's death will relieve us of those sins, are you going to get into that? We are. Okay. That's what this lesson's about. Okay. So, um, in what sense is Christ's death substitutionary? And what does substitutionary mean? What does it mean? Well, in what sense is, uh, what, what, was someone demanding the payment of a debt? How does what Christ did make your life today different? Hopefully, no Christian would argue with the fact that if Christ had not come and died, we could not be saved. But why is that? Wasn't Satan saying, if anyone sins, they have to die in their mind? Mm -hmm. So Satan was arguing that sinners need to die. And, and, then he, and then he said, if you die, you're mine. You, I claim you, God can't have you back. That was his claim. Where did he get the idea that he could make claims? <laughs> he's been doing it without any authority for thousands of years. And he's been making Insanity. lots of them. Insanity. And making lots of claims. Well, way back in the 11th century, a gentleman by the name of Anselm wrote a book, Cur Deus Homo, Why Did God Become Man, basically. And he, he, he said these words, and these are very provocative words, and it's a word, these, are words, these are questions, basically, that very few Christians have thought about, and basically almost, almost no questions have even tried to answer. If God could only save sinners by condemning the innocent, is he truly omnipotent? I mean, if you're omnipotent, aren't you supposed to be able to do anything? So why does say, why does, would God, is it really true that God has to say, well, I can't really save you until somebody over here dies? Does that sound like omnipotence? No. If, on the other hand, he could save us, but he's not willing to do so, how are, do, how are we to think of him as wise and just? What justice could there possibly be in accepting the death of the most innocent man who ever lived in place of the guilty? Does that make any legal sense? No human legal system would accept that. So how can God do such a thing? If this legal transaction makes it possible for God to save sinners because they are covered with the righteousness of Christ, would that suggest that we are brought into heaven without God the Father realizing that we are still sinners? Wouldn't that be legal fiction? Well, those are provocative questions, but on the other side of that issue, notice these words from Leon Morris. When the New Testament speaks of redemption, then, unless our linguistics are at fault, it means that Christ has paid the price of our redemption. To the extent that the price paid must be adequate, and maybe it's a lot more than adequate, for the purchase in question, this indicates an equivalence or a substitution. So that's the thought on that side. I think there's a lot of questions that one could ask about that statement, mm -hmm. because uh, a substitution, if the price paid was Jesus leaving heaven to come and live like a human being, 
it's a different thing because you can't substitute. None of us can go to heaven or claim, no. or claim we left heaven to, to pay this price. So it's, uh, there's a, those are a lot of loaded words there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if we're to believe that God made a payment to purchase our salvation, to whom did he make the payment? And what price did he pay? Did God, did God negotiate with the devil for our salvation? Some yeah. of you are familiar with the, uh, what's, what came to be known as the, the uh, ransom theory. Uh, it was one of the earliest theories about how salvation happened. And the idea was that uh, say, by, by sinning, we all sold ourselves into the hands of Satan. Imagine the infinite negotiating with a creature. Yeah. It's ludicrous at best. Well, according to this theory, because we sold ourselves into the, in, into the power of Satan, God comes down and he says to, the, he says to Satan, okay, I'll be willing to give you Jesus in exchange for all these sinners. Now, Satan has always wanted to be in the place of Jesus. So he says, okay, I'll be happy to give you all these people. Take them. I'll take Jesus. That'll be fine. And then what happens? He can't hold on to Jesus, and Jesus on resurrection morning escapes and goes back to heaven, and the Satan loses everything. In other words, God wins the great controversy by deceiving the devil. Does that sound like a good idea? If he would have done that, he should have done a long time ago. Yeah. He didn't need to run this thousands and thousands of years of, no. of sin. Well, look at Romans <clears throat> 6. Um, and I'm going, to re I'm going to pick out a few verses. Sin must no longer rule in your mortal bodies, so that you obey the desires of your natural self. Nor must you surrender any part of yourself to sin to be used for wicked purposes. Instead, give yourselves to God as those who have been brought to death, brought from death to life, and surrender your whole being to Him to be used for righteous purposes. Sin must not be your master, for you do not live under law, but under grace. And then she goes on to talk about, I mean, I'm sorry, Paul goes on to say, to talk about the fact that you're either slaves of righteousness or you're slaves of sin. Back and forth, that's the only choices we have. What, what does that mean? Well, Jesus himself made it very clear that we cannot serve both God and mammon. Matthew 6, 24. In Romans, Paul said we either serve sin or we serve righteousness. In fact, we are a slave to one or the other. What does it mean to be a slave to sin? Now, aren't, don't we try to serve God on Saturdays or Sundays, and we may serve the world on the other days? I mean, how can Who, who's we... Who's winning if we serve the world for six days and we serve <laughs> God for one day? But how can we always be one way? I mean, we're constantly going between the two. Well, then what does it mean to be a slave of righteousness? Accepting that we cannot do anything for ourselves, by ourselves, and know that God is in control. However, even Paul himself admitted that uh, even the good he wants to do, often he wasn't able to do. Mm -hmm. And the thing he hated the most, sometimes he did. But however, he believed in an omnipotent, almighty God who had his, <laughs> who could who do. Had, yes, who could do for him what he could not Whatever. do for himself. Well, you know, a slave to righteousness, isn't there, oh, the only righteous person or being is God? Mm -hmm. So a slave to God, mm -hmm. a slave to righteousness is being a slave to God. So we're either a slave to sin, and, and Satan is sin, so we're either a slave to uh, Satan or a slave to God. Mm -hmm. So that's a slave to sin or a slave to righteousness, mm -hmm. right? So what does that mean? What, what would it mean? Let's, let's look at the God side. What would it mean to be a slave to God? That we enjoy and prosper and have fun living in his, among his rules. Mm -hmm. And we'll learn about the Father. He says, everything I've learned from my Father I've made known unto you. Well, and, and, and let's, let's be very honest about that. If you're on God's side, are you free at any time 
whether you know you may not hopefully you won't want to do this but are you always free to leave sure yeah. satan left didn't he in the very courts of heaven if you're on satan's side and you're a slave to see to to sin are you free to leave nope. it's not easy it, the Satan gets you wrapped up in a web that's He won't let well, you go. Uh, yeah. God will let you go. You're not, a, you can't leave unless God helps you leave because God is the yeah. only one that can break the gris, grasp of mm -hmm. Satan around you. There was a hymn, and I don't know which one it is, where the man says, God, take my heart and hold it and keep me safe. He knew he wasn't safe on his own and he was asking God to, mm -hmm. for God to keep him close. Well, Paul explains in the first few verses of Romans 6 that to be baptized as a Christian means basically to be to die, to be buried in the water, and to rise to new life. Now, it would be wonderful if that simple process would just get rid of all of our old habits, uh, take care of all the ruts in our mind, as it were, uh, get rid of all the old sins and we would come up there just clean and ready to like Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. Does it happen like that? No. I was baptized with uh, and at the same time a very very old lady was being baptized mm -hmm. and she was saying as we were in the back getting ready she says let me in that pool before I die. <laughs> 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 I thought it was so funny. <laughs> well unfortunately Sin leaves scars. We may choose to follow God, but the scars are still there. The change that comes when we accept Christ does not automatically take away all the effects of past sin, and it certainly does not take away our evil habits. This is not a fault on the part of God. He may treat us as, as if we had never sinned. Sometimes people have said, it's just as if I'd never sinned. That's what justified means but our nervous system does not. We may theologically be dead to our sins and freed from them, but the devil will do everything possible to remind us of those sins whenever he can. I can assure you. But there is a transformation possible. That transformation happens on a daily basis as we get to know God and Jesus Christ better and better. By beholding, we can become changed. Great Controversy 555, paragraph 1. I know you've heard me say that before. It's not easy to die to sin from a human point of view. We do not like to think of ourselves as slaves. So what does it mean to be a slave to righteousness? And how can slavery to righteousness be the same as real freedom? Is that obvious? Well, we suggested that being on God's side he doesn't, he doesn't have jail cells. He doesn't put us in prison and say, no, you can't get out. We're free. We're free completely. Um, 1 John 3, 8, 5, 19, John 12, 31, 16, 11, Ephesians 6, 12, Colossians 1, 16, 2, 15, Romans 8, 38, and 39 make it very clear that the creator of the universe has more than enough power to free us from sin. So what's the problem? If he has plenty of power, shouldn't that take care of it? Unfortunately, they also make it clear that anyone who continues to sin belongs to whom? Yeah. The devil. How does this fit with the fact that Christ has already judged and condemned the devil? I mean, if he's judged and he's condemned and God has won the great controversy already why do we still have this problem but that hasn't happened yet has it well God has won the great controversy hasn't he don't we believe that the devil is definitely de or ultimately defeated well, he won the controversy at the cross mm -hmm. yeah. well, isn't part of the great controversy to um, show that God can heal sin sinners, and that's what's mm -hmm. going on now? Yes. So there's another part of the whole picture, isn't there? Well, we read of people in New Testament times who are de demon-possessed. Conservative Christians believe that that was a reality. 
Unfortunately, many people in our day have a very naturalistic and scientific worldview, and they think that such a thing as demon possession, such things as demon possession, are ideas from an age of superstition and ignorance. While the Bible is scientifically accurate in many respects, it also draws back the curtain on the supernatural world which we otherwise would know nothing about. So why don't we see demon possession today? Or, or do we? What do you think? Do we see demon possessed people walking around? Well, a lot of them are in government. I, <laughs> I really think so. Um, there are people who claim that you can't be a rock star or one of these powerful singers with numbers at the top of the charts without being demon possessed. They sold their soul for rock and roll. Mm -hmm. Satan is very intelligent. He's very talented. And he can give you, he's, he's a good talker. He can give you such skills to do evil. It's absolutely amazing. So when you see a person that just excels in evil, he has to be getting those talents from other than God. Yeah. Well, and many actors are demon-possessed in, in some of the acting that they portray. Well, and... Um, they, they make no, some of them make no bones about yeah. it. And by your fruits you will be known. And so do you have the fruits of Satan or do you have the fruits of God? And, and at the same time, let's recognize that in some of the more primitive areas in the world, there are clearly examples of demon possession today. See, you're more likely to see the openness of it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The highlands of New Guinea and some of the... Mm -hmm. We have sophisticated demons in yes. the United States. Yeah, we yes. give them a pill. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a lot of mental illness. They say, it's always just mental but, illness. Give them a pill. But w when that may be true, but let's think about this. What serves Satan's purposes best? Pious frauds. Today in the more developed countries, he exerts his power through natural forces. People who are controlled by circumstances, I want you to think about this carefully, people who allow themselves to be controlled by circumstances outside of themselves, people who just go crazy at rock concerts, for just as one example, are making themselves open to demon possession because Satan will eventually find ways to manipulate those circumstances and control them. Mm, wow. Let me repeat that. Mm -hmm. People who are controlled by circumstances outside of themselves, they don't have a guiding light within. They don't have the Holy Spirit inside of them guiding them to make right choices no matter what anyone else around them does. So these people are, are, are manipulated, they're moved, they're controlled by circumstances outside of themselves. They are making themselves open to demon possession because Satan will eventually find some way to manipulate those circumstances that, that are influencing them and thus control them. Could that happen even at a... An evangelist. Be, 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 be careful mm -hmm. here. Get healed. Mm -hmm. Could it happen in a Christian church? Mm -hmm. It could. You have to look at the pictures of, of a rock concert and look at the pictures going on at some of these evangelistic things where the people sway and with their arms yeah. extended in there and, and nothing going on upstairs. So it's a way of turning off our intelligence and doing mass hypnosis. And so the the person is moving these groups of people, manipulating them. That's one of the ways in which it could happen. I think the devil mm -hmm. adjusts for what society yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And but the high levels of one's mind get destroyed first by all these mm -hmm. drugs and you're yeah. left with the primal instincts and then away well, it goes. Yeah, think, think, think what devil, the devil has accomplished through drugs. Oh dear. You see? Now, when you go and watch uh, a movie, that has full screen, loud noise. 3D. 3D, and it is forming your opinion about things. Mm -hmm. Is that um, allowing demons to talk to you if, if that program is teaching bad things or? 
if you're just familiarizing them with, with the possibility, if you look at some of the ads around in the papers, on TV, it's getting worse and worse yeah. and lower and lower and more disgusting. Mm -hmm. So, Seventh-day Adventists believe in the great controversy between God and Satan over the character and government of God. Ellen White wrote her Opus Magnum, if we wish to call it that, the five-volume series known as The Conflict of the Ages, in which she spelled out in considerable detail that great controversy. As you understand the great controversy, how does it impact your life on a day-by-day -day basis? Where does the con great controversy actually take place? Right in your mind. Right inside the right minds in of human beings. The papers and the radio, as you can I tell think it's, it's wonderful. It gives you the overall picture, and it, it helps fit things together. Instead of the Bible, it, it just gives you... I, I think I've always been a big picture person. Mm -hmm. If I don't know the big picture, I feel confused looking at the parts. Mm -hmm. If you know the big picture, the parts become clearer. Mm -hmm. Well... Satan is alive and well on planet Earth. I don't think any of us have any questions about that. And he works through many channels. Colossians 2, especially verses 8 and 14 and 20, and Galatians 4, 1 to 14, support that idea. Some of Satan's tools include the worthless deceit, and these are Paul's words, the worth, well, I should say, translated into English, the worthless deceit of human wisdom, our record of past sins, even slavery to the weak and pitiful ruling spirits of this world. We may not fi fully understand exactly what Paul had in mind when he spoke of these things, but surely every one of us has had experience with the temptations and power of the devil. Well, Christ has promised us victory from this bondage to sin. How do we claim that? Bible study and prayer. How do we make Christ and God the top priority in our lives? If we spend almost all of our time trying to keep up with worldly pursuits and have little time for Bible study, prayer, and witnessing, we will find ourselves becoming more and more transformed into the image of what? The world which we spend our, with which we spend our time. If we want to become more like God, we need to spend more time with Him. So if the devil has been defeated and Christ has already gained the victory, why does God still allow the devil to roam about like a lion looking for, a play to, looking for prey to devour? You remember those words from 1 Peter 5, 8. Be alert. Be on the watch. Your enemy, the devil, roams like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. And, and what, how does the devil devour someone? Now, of course, it's a, a picture that we recognize from, you know, lions and on their kill and so forth. But Satan is anxious to tear us apart, to he destroy grabs, us. He grabs whatever we have inside us that allows him to get a handle on us. And he slaps us to the ground and then he slaps us again. And then he just, you know... He mm -hmm. just beats us up and leaves us there. By controlling our mind. Mm -hmm. Colossians 2.15. Let's read that for a second. And on that cross, Christ freed himself from the power of the spiritual rulers and authorities. He made a public spectacle of them by leading them as captives in his victory possess uh, procession. What does that mean? Well... Christ literally stripped the devil of his outer garments. That's what the verse means. These would be his weapons, even his armor. But the devil is still working very successfully and unfortunately often through religions and religious leaders. Look at John 8, especially John 8, 44. Let me just turn there for a second. Remember, this is Jesus' extensive conversation with whom? Church leaders? The church leaders, the Sanhedrin of his day. You are the children of your father, the devil, and you want to follow your father's desires. 
From the very beginning, he was a murderer and has never been on the side of truth because there is no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he's only doing what is natural to him because he is a liar and the father of all lies. Now, none of us could be like that, right? There, there was something in there. So truth is to be sought after and lies are to be avoided. Mm -hmm. So we're to have an open mind to try to get to the truth. Mm -hmm. well, so that our father won't be the devil, the liar. Look at these words from Ellen White. Very, very significant words. After Christ's death, Satan saw that his disguise was torn away. His administration was laid open before the unfallen angels and before the heavenly universe. He had revealed himself as a murderer. Now let's stop for a moment and let's see if we can clarify what that means. What happened at Calvary? Jesus died. Satan's intentions were exposed. Satan's plan. Well, think about this for a second. What did Satan want most of all from Jesus Christ? What did Jesus Satan said. want? He wanted him to sin. He didn't accomplish that. His second choice would be what? For, God, for Jesus to leave. For Jesus to say, I won't, I'm not going to sin, but this whole thing is just not worth it. I am leave these people to their own results. I'm going to go back to heaven. Satan was not able to accomplish either one of those things. But as he, Jesus came to that final weekend and he's, faced with the devil and, and, and all that happened, and we don't have time to talk about the whole thing. Satan realizes that how much time does he have left? He's been working for 33 years to try to get Jesus to sin, and he hasn't accomplished it yet. And he's, 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 he, he, on the one side, he wants to torture Jesus, to do everything he can to try to get Jesus to give up, or even to commit sin, to become impatient or something like this. On the other hand, he realizes that the more he tortures him, what's going to happen sooner or later? He's going to die, and then the whole battle is going to be over with, isn't it? Without Jesus sinning. Without now, Jesus sinning. When you say Jesus tortured, uh, I mean Satan tortured Jesus, mm -hmm. it wasn't Satan himself that was torturing Jesus. It was human beings that were allowing themselves to be tools in Satan's hands that were torturing Jesus. But so, Ellen White, well, go ahead. So how terrible for us to be a tool of the devil, mm -hmm. to allow ourselves to be a tool of the devil. Yes. However, I would remind you that Ellen White also says in Desire of Ages that the mental anguish that Christ felt because the separation from his father was so terrible. And of course, who, who was bringing about that separation between God and the Son? It was Satan. That was so awful and so horrible that his physical pain was hardly felt. His mental anguish was that great. Well, he was sweat and blood. He was mm -hmm. so anguished. Yep. By shedding, I'm reading, turning now to Desire of Ages. By shedding the blood of the Son of God, he, Satan, had uprooted himself from the sympathies of the heavenly beings. Henceforth, his work was restricted. When we say restricted, what do we mean? He was kept in one place, pretty much. And what's, where's the one place? Oh, right here with Here us. on planet Earth. So he was restricted, be Satan was restricted because no one would believe him anymore. The rest of the universe and wouldn't the believe him anymore. The rest of the universe. Anymore. If he tried to go there, they would just say, get, get away from us, get out of here, we don't want to have anything to do with you. Or as they say, we saw your true colors. Yep. Whatever attitude he might assume, this is Satan again, he could no longer await the angels as they came from the heavenly courts, and before them accused Christ's brethren of being clothed with the garments of blackness and the defilement of sin. So that implies, what was he doing before that? Being a general nuisance. <laughs> he was accusing Christ and Christ's followers of being evil. Can you think of a specific example from the Old Testament where he did that? Where he accused a follower of Christ of being evil? In the heavenly courts. 
Zechariah. Yeah, Zechariah 3. Zechariah 3, and another very personal example. Did Job. Satan ever, yeah, Job. Yeah, didn't he go right to the courts of heaven and said, look, I'm the ruler of this earth. I'm the one in charge down there. And God said, what? Uh, by the way, have you considered my servant Job? <laughs> I could just see Satan sort of saying, um, well, yeah. <laughs> you know, uh -huh. you can just see him, well, uh -huh. yeah. Well, let me add him and he won't be your servant for long. Exactly. So when we talk about Satan waiting at the gates, uh, to, to come to speak to the angels as they came out. This is the kind of stuff he was doing. And before them accused Christ's brethren of being clothed with the garments of blackness and the defilement of sin. The last link of sympathy between Satan and the heavenly world was broken. He had cooked his goose. So before the death of Christ, they still had some questions about God. And they said, Satan, I think you might have something here. Yeah. But at that time, Satan exposed himself for, for so what he really was. He yeah. showed his colors. And they said, nope, now we understand. And we don't want to have anything to do with you, Satan. Yeah. Yet, reading the next paragraph, yet Satan was not then destroyed. Why not? The angels did not even then understand all that was involved in the great controversy. And they had just seen Jesus go through that whole process, including the actual death process. They saw exactly what God was doing. They saw exactly what Satan was doing every minute. Of, and you can be sure that every eye on the on, entire unlooking universe was glued on that cross through that whole process. And how many human beings were watching and understanding what was going on? None. Zero. Not a single human being understood what was going on there. So what do you suppose it is that the angels still don't understand? Probably not a full appreciation of the magnitude where this is going to go. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at the history since Christ left. And look at the papers today. Mm -hmm. The number of people that have been killed on all kinds of wars in all kinds of generations, it just boggles the mind. Yeah. And it's not over yet. No. Do you think God had to demonstrate his healing power for the humans that are still here on earth and just swimming in sin and he can still heal? Well, here's, here's, here's what I think we're, we're up against. Satan has always claimed that he could run a better universe than God does. Yeah. And God, at the end, we're told, will gradually withdraw himself and allow Satan to have more and more control. And, and the, the, the angels looking on are going to see what would happen if Satan was really in, under control, in control. If Satan was God of the universe, what would happen? Yeah. Now, at the same time, God is going to say, I have this group of people that are mine. And Satan, you can, you can harass them, you can do what you like in that sense, but you cannot destroy them. I will not allow it. And Satan is going to, is realizing that he's up against the final events of this earth's history and his own demise, he's going to do, he would, there's nothing he wants to do except to destroy and get at those people that are God's people. And he can't, and it makes him absolutely furious. And what, when he does that, what does that show to the onlooking universe? The results of the sin. It yeah. shows what kind of a person he is, doesn't it? That's right. So not everything has been revealed yet. The principles at stake were to be more fully revealed. And for the sake of man, Satan's existence must be continued. Why would that be? So make a decision. You have to see evil. We have to, we have to understand the truth about him. And we have so much evidence explaining everything to us. We should, we should have gotten it. We should have figured it out. We may think we're just a little bit bad, mm -hmm. but it's going to show us that without God, 
our little bit of badness is going to get worse and worse yeah. and worse and worse till we're going to end up like Satan himself. Yeah. Man, the final sentence, man as well as angels must see the contrast between the prince of light and the prince of darkness. He must choose whom he will serve. And that's Desire of Ages, page 761. Something similar is, is, is in volume 6 of the Testimonies, page 41. A battle unseen by human eyes is being waged. The army of the Lord is on the ground, seeking to save souls. Satan and his host are also at work. So we can see the two armies, armies at battle here, trying in every possible way to deceive and destroy. Day by day, the battle goes on. If our eyes could be opened to see the good and evil agencies at work, there would be no trifling, no vanity, no jesting or joking. If, if all would put on the whole armor of God and fight manfully the battles of the Lord, victories would be gained that would cause the kingdom of darkness to tremble. Wow. You know, but all that is battles we think of guns and bombs and stuff. All this is um, verbal and mental. It's a verbal, mental, arguing, debating, mm -hmm. choose your side in your head and your heart type battle. What are some of the devil's methods to try to frighten, to intimidate, to tempt us? Well, an example is given in Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Look at those verses. Since the children, as he calls them, are people of flesh and blood, Jesus himself became like them and shared their human nature. He did this so that through his death he might destroy the devil who has the power over death. And in this way set free those who were slaves, we've been talking about slavery, those who were slaves all their lives because of their fear of death. Who is it that slaves all their lives because of their fear of death? us. Why? Why would we be slaves because of our fear of death? Our fear of death. Let you free. Set you our free. fear of death has us do things we would normally not do okay. because we're afraid. Uh, it's manipulative. A lot of people make you afraid to make you jump someplace that they want you to. Yeah. Well, very often a large percentage of fear is our response to the unknown. Look at the experience of the disciples. When Christ was crucified, where were they? Locked up in the room. <laughs> Locked up in the upper room. And what were they doing there? They were scared to death. They were afraid they were going to be next, right? When Christ was crucified and they realized that he was dead and buried, they went into deep mourning, hiding in the upper room behind locked doors. They were certain that they were going to be next. But look at what happened to the disciples a few weeks later after the Ascension and Pentecost. They were transformed by their new understanding of what Christianity was all about, and they had no further fear of death. Look at the end of Peter's speech and its conclusions as, as reported in Acts 14, verse 13. You know, here's, and I, we just need to back up and read a couple of these verses. Acts 4. I'm sorry, you're correct. Acts 4, verse... I'm going to start reading with verse 8. Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, answered them, leaders of the people and elders. Now he's talking to the same Sanhedrin that Jesus had called what? In the vipers. You are, full, you are the sons of your father, the devil, right? These are the same, Peter now, the same people. Now Peter's talking to them. Peter, full of the Holy Spirit, answered them, leaders of the people and elders. If we are being questioned today about the good deed done to the lame man, remember this, the thing that brought this all about was the fact that they had healed the man at the, at the gate beautiful, and how he was healed, then you should all know, and all the people of Israel should know, that this man stands before you completely well through the power of the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, and whom God raised from death. Jesus is the one of whom the scripture says, the stone that you builders despised turned out to be the most important of all. Salvation is to be found through him alone in all the world. There is no one else 
whom God has given who can save us. And it tried to imagine how the Sanhedrin would feel as they heard Jesus, I mean, they heard Peter say these words. I mean, this is the guy who, what, a few weeks before, just sort of curled up and, 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 and is, you know, into his shell when a woman pointed a finger at him. I think you're from Galilee. Oh, 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 no, not me, not me. And he cursed and swore to prove that he was not a follower of Jesus. I think well, for a short time that you could have heard a pin drop. Yep. The high priest would have, wouldn't have known which way to look. Exactly. Well, it goes on to say, and these, this is the verse I wanted to focus on, the members of the council were amazed to see how bold Peter and John were and to learn that they were ordinary men of no education. Now, what did that mean? Not educated in the school of the not, Pharisees. Not educated in the schools of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They realized then that they had been companions of Jesus. So who had the world's best education? <laughs> companions of Jesus. The companions of Jesus. So now, what did Christ accomplish in Gethsemane and on Calvary though so, that so completely defeated the devil? Well, back in the beginning, God had said that sin leads to death. You remember Genesis 2, 17. In effect, the devil said, that's not true. God is lying to you. And you remember Genesis 3, 1 to 5. So who is telling us the truth? When Jesus drank the cup of suffering, even in the Garden of Gethsemane, before anyone had touched him in terms of beating or persecution, he fell dying to the ground. Desire of Ages 693, paragraph 1. God had to send an angel to revive him so that he could go out and go through that whole incredible experience of trials, beatings, and crucifixion. But Jesus had already demonstrated to the entire universe that sin all by itself kills. Not only in the first death, but also in the second death. He did it again on Calvary. He did not die of crucifixion. Death from crucifixion usually took days, not a few hours. Following the death of Abel, Satan began to claim that the reason people were dying was that God was upset at them for sinning. Thus, God was the one responsible for their deaths. But what did Jesus say when he died? Did he really die, first of all? Yes. yes. He really did. Even in the Garden of Gethsemane, he had to be revived. Or he would have died right there. But he really died. And what did he say about the cause of his death? Was it God killing him? Did he say, my God, my God, why are you killing me? No, he said, what? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew 27, 46. And incredible as it may seem, the one group of people who claimed to be the closest followers of God were the ones who were out there crucifying their Messiah and God, hoping to get him buried in time so they could rush home and keep the Sabbath in honor of the one they had just crucified. Can you imagine anything so ironic, so satanic? Well, that's how mixed up we get as humans. Yeah. We, we, we fall prey to these um, lies. That's why we have to seek out the truth. So how do you think religious leaders, the ones who claim to be the closest followers of God, how could they have become so confused? Could, of course, that couldn't happen to us, right? They liked power <laughs> they like power and honor and control mm -hmm. and so they weren't willing to listen okay any other suggestions about how they got like that they were controlled by the devil they were they, as we read earlier the foundation of every re heathen religion is reliance on yourself yep and that's what they were doing that's so why they were quite they happy in wealthy with it. They were relying on the religion that they had built? Mm -hmm. Well, Satan had tried to claim that he should be treated as equal with Christ. That was way back in heaven. God had said that it is not possible because Satan is a creature and not a creator and not God. <clears throat> on Resurrection Sunday morning, Jesus arose in his own power and returned to heaven, thus proving that he is God. 
There's some interesting verses about that. Look at John 10, 17 and 18. This is Jesus speaking. The Father loves me because I am willing to give up my life in order that I may receive it back again. So who's giving up his life? It's Jesus. No one takes my life away from me. I give it up of my own free will. I have the right, I have the authority. The word there is authority. I have the right to give it up and I have the right to take it back. This is what my Father has commanded me to do. So Jesus did what? He gave it up, and on Sunday, that resurrection morning, what did he do? He took it back. And thus proved that he was what? God. Not a human being, not a creature. He was God. Look at John 2.19. Jesus answered, Tear down this temple, and in three days... I will build it again. And what was he talking about? He was talking about himself, his own human body. Desire of Ages, of course, expounds on this. If you look at page 785, paragraph 2, it spells it out in considerable detail. Satan's accusations and questions raising doubts about God have been totally answered and refuted. In fact, a lot of those questions and accusations against God were, were refuted all the way back in, at creation week. Remember, Satan had said, God is not willing to share his creative power, right? And how did he share his creative power? He allowed humans to procreate, to create little creatures of their own. By cooperating together, hopefully in a loving environment, we can create little beings like ourselves. Well, probably what made Satan mad is even the animals can create. Yeah. And can he create? No. no. Don't you think he create would... Create a mess. He could... <laughs> <laughs> he could create a mess, but don't you think he would love... I mean, what he wanted most of all was to be able to create. We have a capacity that Satan doesn't have. Amazing. Is that part of when God says, let's make man in our image? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But in the eyes of the onlooking universe, a great controversy was over 2,000 years ago. The questions basically were over. And we read earlier the, the passage that says they still had some questions. They still had some you know, points in their mind they weren't completely sure about. And we suggested that at least one possibility is they still haven't seen God step back and let Satan really have almost, almost complete control of this earth. So they still haven't seen that. Is that when the angels let go? Yeah. And God lets go. Yeah. So one way of looking at it is the, uh, there was a big election. Mm -hmm. And at the cross, all those undecideds mm -hmm. went for God. Yes. And even though the creatures of the universe that now voted for God weren't absolutely convinced that he was right. They were convinced enough to ignore Satan. Mm -hmm. and, and, and vote in God's, on God's side. Yeah. It's only here on this earth that we have not yet understood all that God through Christ intended to teach us. When will we learn? And what is it that we need to learn? Do we need to go back and look through Scripture and those of us who are Adventists, look through the writings of Ellen White and look at the accusations Satan has made against God. Let me give you a start. Satan claimed that God was arbitrary, vengeful, unforgiving, exacting, severe, a tyrant. If you look on our website at theox.org, uh, you can see there are several places, especially the handout uh, uh, the plan of salvation and the setting of the great controversy, all kinds of accusations that Satan has made against God. And you can find that handout under resources, the yes. resources section. Under the resources section in, in, in our, in our um, and Gordon should know, he helped to put it there. So look there at, at those things and look at all the accusations Satan has made against God and then see if you can answer for yourself how each one of those accusations has been answered starting right from creation down through the history of our world through especially the life and death of Jesus here on this earth and 
the resurrection, as we have just mentioned, all of that helps to answer the questions that Satan and the accusations Satan has made. And those were the, those were the, the answers that, that answered the questions for the universe, the onlooking universe, weren't they? The same things. So this great controversy, and, and let, let, let me just show you a couple of passages in Scripture that, that support that idea. Uh, look at Ephesians 3, verses 9 and 10. I'm sorry, somehow or other I didn't get to where I wanted to go. Let's try again. And of making, well, the good news is about the infinite riches of Christ, and of making all people see how God's secret plan is to be put into effect. God, who is the creator of all things, kept his secret hidden through all the past ages, in order that at the present time, by means of the church, that's us, the angelic rulers and powers in the heavenly world might learn of his wisdom in all its different forms. And then we, we, we look over to Colossians, the first chapter, starting with verse 19. For it was by God's own decision that the Son has in himself the full nature of God. Through the Son then, this would be through his death, God decided to bring the whole universe back to himself. God made peace through his son's blood, and that would be his sacrificial death on the cross, and so brought back to himself all things, both on earth and in heaven. So the entire universe has been brought back together through an understanding of what happened on the cross. And we're the only ones who haven't got it yet. Could you summarize briefly what, what Jesus showed, what God showed on the cross? Well, he showed the fact that sin leads to death. He showed that it's not death at the hands of God. And he showed what happens if we misunderstand that and try to worship God in our own way because that's what the Pharisees did and they were the ones out there trying to kill Jesus. And those are just some of the things which Christ demonstrated. Well. Do we want to be on God's side or do we want to be on Satan's side? We do not want God to forsake us. No. Does it help to know that he, Satan is a defeated foe? I certainly hope so. Do you have any questions about whether or not Satan is fully defeated and that God is the only one in this conflict that can be truly trusted? I hope you don't have any more questions. Let's trust him every day in our daily lives. See you next week.